We're going to enter the ninth chapter of Ketubot now. And we're going to begin with questions about essentially contract and custom. Actually, in English law and in US law as well, contract really takes precedence. So if two, if two parties agree and, and write a contract, then that stands, even if it's against, so to speak, custom. But in halakha, custom, I would say, has a slightly stronger role than it does in English law. And we'll see that in, in a, there are situations where the husband might give an undertaking in writing to his wife, but the courts will interpret it narrowly. And in fact, there's going to be one situation where the courts in, overturn it entirely. So the balance between, if you like, custom and contract is slightly more heavily weighted in halakha than it is, say, in classic English law. And um, thinking about it on my feet, actually, in uh, European law, which is heavily influenced by Roman law, again, sort of custom and, custom, custom and law quite often can overrule contract. Contract's much weaker on the continent than it is in the UK. So, and of course, the rabbis know about Roman law. So may, maybe there's a little bit of Roman law influence in halakha here. Who knows? Anyway, the Mishnah begins. Hakatel ishto, someone who writes to his wife. And this is writing in the Ketubah. And the presumption has got to be that this is one of the conditions of marriage. So presumably her family have demanded that he makes this condition. So he writes to his wife. He writes in the Ketubah. Din udubarim ein li bi bi Din udubarim, a judgment and words. is tra translated here as I've got no claim. Judgment and words, I have no claim on your possession. It's translated, I've got no claim whatsoever. Judgment and words, I've got no claim on your property. So he writes that. What's the result? He can still enjoy its income during her lifetime. In other words, we, we interpret, the courts are going to interpret this at the most minimal possible interpretation. Namely, he's got no claim on the principal, but he can still enjoy the income. The imeta yorsha. And if he if she dies, then he can inherit her. So it's a pretty minimal interpretation. And the Mishnah is going to ask the im kain lama katab din uvari mainly we be be in a If so, why did he write? I've got no claim whatsoever on your property. And the Mishnah answers she im achravet nat na kayam. At least it establishes that if she sold it or if she gave it away, then her act is valid. So she does have some control. She has more control over the property than she would otherwise. It once he's written this condition in the Kutuba. And again, you know, you can see why this is a condition that the family might have asked. Now let's see some stronger conditions. Katavla, he wrote, Dinu dvarim ainli bi nechasaich u tehem. I've got no claim whatsoever on your property and on their produce, on its produce. I.e., he's not getting the income. And the Mishnah rules, Eino ochel perot v'chayeha ve'im meita yorsha. So in that case, he doesn't enjoy the income during her lifetime. And, um, but when she dies, he still inherits. And Rabbi Yudah will kind of disagree. Rabbi Yudah will marry a little lamb who will help perot ha'she yichtov la'adin u'dvarim e'in li'bin l'sachayich u v'ferotehen u'vifu free feral to him ad le olam. Rabbi Judah says, look, he can always enjoy the income unless he wrote to her saying, I've got no claim whatsoever on your property and upon its produce and on the produce of its produce forever. And I think the situation we're looking at here is, okay, maybe, maybe he doesn't have a claim on the income, but if she invests the income, she gets capital. 
And the suggestion is perhaps he's got a claim on the income from the investment of the income. This is compound interest we're talking about here. And so Rabbi Yudah says, look, there's always going to be some element of compound interest unless he writes he's got no claim whatsoever on your income, on the income from the income, on the income on the income from the income, and the income on the third, fourth, fifth level of income forever. Unless he makes this statement, he can enjoy the income. Katabla, Dinu Dvarim, Ainli. Katabla, Dinu Dvarim, Ainli, Bina Chasaich, Uferotehem, Uvi Free, Ferotehem, Bahayaich, Uvi Motai. So maybe he writes this. He writes, I've got no claim on your property, on its produce, on the produce of its produce during your lifetime and after your death or during your death I'm, I never have a claim on this and the Mishnah rules he doesn't enjoy income during her lifetime and he doesn't inherit her when she dies so he has really written written himself out there. I mean, this is a, a classic prenup from a, from a, when the wife's family is rich. The husband has got no rights whatsoever to this property during her lifetime and after the lifetime. And Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel is going to object. Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, Omer, imeta yerashena. Rabbi Shimon Gamliel says, look, when she dies, he does inherit. Even if he writes a contract suggesting he's not going to, Rabban Shimon, Rabban Shimon ben Gamia is going to override the contract. What's his reasoning? Because he's making condition against what's written in the Torah. You can't make a contract that's against the provisions of the Torah. And then he gives the general principle, she called Hamatne Alakatu Shiva Torah Tanao Batel. Anyone who makes a condition that's not consistent with Torah, his condition is void. Now, this is really interesting. Where does it say in Torah that the husband inherits his wife? And the truth is, it doesn't. It doesn't. The laws of inheritance will we'll read in about three or four weeks. They're at the end of the part of Pinchas. So there's the inheritance of the daughters of Slofka. Interestingly, the laws of inheritance are brought in the they're brought the hook that we bring them on in the Torah is actually the inheritance of a set of daughters who whose um, father didn't leave sons. So it, they begin with a feminist. You could say with with a, a um, that you could say the laws of inheritance begin with a a discussion about women's property rights, and they don't say anywhere. You, you'll see when we get to the part of Pinchas, read those very carefully, and you will see that they never mention that they never mention that a husband inherits his wife, and the Rambam exp uh, the Bartonura explains that. While the Torah never made this condition, the rabbis learned it out. They learned it out from the verses. And you know the rabbi, and we've seen before, the rabbis are very particular about their, so to speak, their honor, their kavod. And when they make a judgment, sometimes they emphasize the importance of that judgment. They'll say, oh yeah, it's a din Torah, it comes from the Torah. It doesn't come from the Torah. But they treat it, they're strict as if it came from the tribe just in order to protect their authority. Now, what if, what if somebody, now let's just play this the other way around. So we've been talking about what happens when she dies. But what about when he dies? And what if there are various claims on the estate? Someone died and he left a wife, he left creditors, and he left heirs. Furthermore, he had some liquid movable assets. He had a deposit or a loan in the possession of others. Now, the Mishnah knows, by the way, that in general, 
um, kind of movable possessions and money or a deposit or a loan is, is considered a movable possession in the, 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 in the land, in the kind of the world of the Mishnah, the, a fixed possession is land, a movable possession is money and movable possessions can't be mortgaged. So generally they can't be seized by the creditors. They can't be seized by the predators. So they're kind of available for whoever comes and takes them. Well, anyway, they're available for, for whoever comes and takes them first. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do with, with, with this deposit or the loan in the position of others? Rabbi Tarfon Omer, Rabbi Tarfon says he's going to be given to the one who's shell who's the most failing who's under the greatest disadvantage as if Rabbi Tarpon's going to make a judgment about the needs of these different individuals the wife the creditors and the heirs and he's going to give it to the one who kind of deserves it I should say by the way and the Ramban makes this clear in the in what he calls today's halakha okay he, the halakha at the time of the Ramban but this is pretty sir I mean this is written in today's ketubah in in today in the halakha of the time of the Rambam, movable possessions could be mortgaged by the way. So, in practical terms, we never ruled like this in the time of the Rambam, and we certainly do don't. I mean, the, today's ketubah said that every single possession of the husband is mortgaged to the ketubah, even his clothes. So we don't rule like this today, but we did in the time of the Mishnah. Rab, 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 so Rabbi Tarfon is going to make a moral judgment. He's going to say, we'll give that those move, that movable property to the one who needs it the most. Rabbi Akiva Omer. Rabbi Akiva says, Ain Rahamim Badin. There is no mercy in law. We don't make moral judgments on financial matters. The mon monetary law is not like that. Ela. But we're going to give it to the heirs. The heirs are going to get the movable property. All the others actually require an oath. So the, the creditor has to take an oath that he hasn't been paid. The wife has to take an oath that she hasn't already been paid, the substance of her ketubah. But heirs, inheritors, do not need to swear an oath. They can inherit without swearing an oath. As the Mishnah concludes, the Ain Hayor Shin Srichim Shwa. Inheritors do not need an oath. Everybody else needs an oath, but the inheritors don't. And so Rabbi Akiva will rule on the basis of din rather than on the basis of basis of Rachamim, on the basis of law rather than mercy. We're going to give the movable assets to the heirs.